Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank the uh, Senator from Washington for her leadership on tech and technology issues, and in particular uh, on net neutrality. Uh, I'd like to uh, amend one thing that she said. She said we've got about 5 million comments in favor of net neutrality on this question. It is true. Yesterday we had 5 million and change, uh, but uh, I just checked, and we are at 6.728 million, uh, and more and more people are weighing in uh, on this important issue. As of today, it's important to point out that net neutrality is the law of the land. We're not asking for a change in the way that the Internet operates. We're asking uh, for the Internet as we know it to be preserved. And so what does that really mean? It means that you have an arrangement with your ISP. You pay your Internet service provider for access to the Internet, and you get the whole Internet. Your provider does not get to decide what you access, you do. Whether it's NBC or ABC or Hulu or Netflix or Breitbart or Google or Yahoo or Facebook or the New York Times or Red State or Hot Air or whatever you want, you get to go there and everything comes down from the internet at whatever speed it comes down. But without net neutrality, that arrangement could change. The free and open internet, as we understand it, it's a premise of the way we use the internet. It's a premise of the internet economy. It's a premise of Silicon Valley. It's now become a premise of car companies and real estate companies and anybody who does business online that of course you wouldn't have to pay money to an ISP to make sure your website loads fast enough so that consumers can see it. But that freedom, that free and open internet really is in danger. So here's what's happening. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, is trying to change the internet by ending the net neutrality rules that were put in place. And if they succeed, your ISP will have the power to stop you from seeing certain kinds of content. They will be the ones that get to make decisions about what you can access and how fast, not you. It is a foundational change in the way the internet operates. Now, some people will say, including the internet company uh, uh, lobbyists and their CEOs will say, look, the companies aren't going to change the internet even if the law goes away. In fact, we're, we're committing to voluntary net neutrality. That's what they say. But I want you to think about how likely it is that a publicly traded company won't at least explore the possibility of different business models. And here's the problem. There may be opportunities without net neutrality for them to make more money, right? So right now, you get, I have basic cable in my apartment, right? I don't have HBO. I, uh, back in Hawaii, I have HBO and the whole deal. But, back, uh, but, but in my apartment here, I have more basic cable. I pay for a certain number of channels, right? I don't get access to the entire TV universe. I pay for packages. There is no reason under the law, should they repeal net neutrality, that an ISP couldn't, couldn't give you the liberal package, which you could pay $75 for, or the conservative package, which you could pay $75 for, or the NBC-related uh, families package, which you could pay $120 for, or maybe it's free because it's part of a vertical, which is included in your ISP. The whole idea here is that there is nothing preventing them, except these net neutrality laws, from deciding who you get, where you get to visit, and how fast the downloads come. This is especially important, of course, in the entertainment space when we're all streaming TV and news and movies and even gaming online. So that the relationship between the person who creates the content, right, and you is going to be intermediated by an ISP. And so if you've got a great app idea, Right now, you just have to have a great app idea. If you've got a great website, people can log on to your website and you are in business. But if you've got the next great website, if you've got eBay or Craigslist or Amazon, but it's post-net neutrality, post-net neutrality and the FCC goes through with this, you will need not a bunch of engineers but a bunch of lawyers and business sharks to try to negotiate with the ISP to even get in the door to even get 
in the door. Students could have less access to online resources, including online classes. Realtors would be stopped from using online tools to sell their homes. Patients might not be able to use the internet to communicate with their doctors or monitor their health. Musicians, photographers, entrepreneurs will use the tools that everybody depends on to make a living or share their art online. And you know, I was talking to somebody who, who I know in the tech community and they were sort of saying, listen, this is just a parade of horribles. None of this is going to come true. And I said, why do you think that that's true? Why do you think this is just some apocryphal scenario that I'm describing? Why wouldn't you, if you were an ISP, slice up the internet and sell it for more. If you're the one controlling the access to it, and you're a publicly traded company, you have no duty to a free and open internet. You have a duty to maximize shareholder profits. And if your board of directors comes to you and says, you know what, this whole, you pay a flat fee and you get the whole internet, that's not the right business model. Look at these areas where ISPs uh, uh, are the only provider in many communities. So the idea that a consumer has a choice, in lots of rural communities, you have only one broadband provider in the first place. So why wouldn't a broadband provider slice and dice up the internet and charge you a la carte? They can get more money for this. It's not that they're bad people, it's that they're duty bound to maximize profits. So today, July, sec uh, to, excuse me, July 12th is the day of action. The internet is pushing back. Today we stand up to the FCC so that the internet remains free and open. And as we speak, I mean literally as we speak, thousands and thousands of people across the country by the minute are logging onto the FCC website to express themselves. And I just got to say, you know, this has become a democratic issue. This has become a progressive issue. But it wasn't so long ago. It wasn't so long ago that people in the conservative movement, we're worried about media consolidation. In the conservative movement, we're saying, hey, listen, I don't know who's going to own my media company, but I want to get to my websites to get my content at whatever rate it comes down. Don't tell me what information I get to have access to. to. Everybody uses the internet. And lots of people are spending you know, dozens of hours a week on the internet via their phones, uh, via their television, via their broadband connection at home. Uh, and the innovation economy that underlies our economic growth is really in jeopardy. And I know it's an arcane process. I know most people probably haven't even heard of the FCC. And to talk about net neutrality and lay all this jargon on you, it's concerning that, that the free and open internet is really in danger. But we have this unique opportunity because unlike what happened a few months ago with consumer privacy where very quickly this body reversed a rule that provides for privacy so that your broadband providers can't resell your personal browsing data to a third party advertiser or any other company. That happened very quickly and without any public input. But here's the really good thing about the FCC process. The statute provides for public input. So we are in a public comment period, and July 17th is the deadline. So there is an opportunity for people to let their voices be heard. The internet should be in the hands of people, not in the hands of companies. I yield the floor.